Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. We all value the health of our natural environment, but how do we define that health? For instance, is the expansion of non-native species that is occurring around the world truly a major problem, or are some people being species purists unnecessarily? To help us explore that question, we're honored to have Doug Talmy, author of Bringing Nature Home and chair of the Entomology and Wildlife Ecology Department at the University of Delaware. Doug, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Barbara. Pleasure to be here. You were here a little over a year ago talking about your book, and we had a great interview, and I'd like to refer viewers to the archive of that interview, which can be accessed from our website at ewashington.org forward slash greenroom, and also to Doug's Doug's website at bringingnaturehome.net. Today we're going to head off in a little bit different direction. But before we do, can you give us a, one or two sentences, I know it's hard, but about uh, summarizing some of your major points? Uh, okay, the, the, the major point I'm trying to make is that plants matter uh, and that we are landscaping today in the places where we work and we, we uh, live in ways that don't uh, don't capitalize on what plants do. Plants are the first trophic lever. They're the group of organisms that provide food for everything else. Uh, and if they don't do that, then the food webs that are depending on those plants collapse. So the way we landscape today typically relies on plants that are from someplace else, often from Asia. And those plants are very poor at supporting the food webs that support the biodiversity in this country. So if we don't turn that around, if we don't use our own yards, uh, as productive places to support food webs, we're going to lose that biodiversity. Okay, that's a great review. And as another introduction, I would like to show a four-minute clip of a video that we did for uh, shoreline homeowners. But the concepts presented there are definitely universal, uh, applicable to inland uh, landscapes as well. We must also control invasive species, which are degrading our natural areas, reducing their value to wildlife and to humans. Invasive species tend to be one of those issues that people feel they can't do anything about. But there are things that people can do, and those things have been proven effective. The first thing is education on what to look for. They're called rhizomes. 10 to 15 feet tall, you can grow in large clumps that blocks your view of the, of the lake. Um, it keeps the native plants and animals from, away from the area. After education comes regular monitoring the early detection rapid response strategy to identify it when it first becomes established on the site and then take some action to try to keep it from overrunning the site. If you find invasives encroaching upon your property, get with your neighbors and formulate an action plan like they did on Beaver Island when invasive Phragmites was first discovered there. The community really rallied around, we got the state involved and we went after this to try to protect our shorelines. Invasive Phragmites should be treated by a professional with herbicides that are safe for wetlands. Invasives like Phragmites are rarely planted intentionally, but there are many plants that reach new areas because we bring them there on purpose. Don't judge a book by its cover. Even plants labeled as earth-friendly can get out of control. For instance, Creeping Charlie, or Moneywort, can spread rapidly in moist areas. Dry habitats are also at risk. I bought this little tiny pot of this sedum because we were trying to get this rock garden started and we were really surprised to see that it went from the front yard to the backyard and we didn't do anything to bring it there. It's not just what you plant, but what your neighbor plants that you need to watch out for. He put it in because he thought it looked attractive, like a couple of clumps. Now it's taken over his entire property. That stream is completely choked with it and it's encroached into my stream, and I don't know how to get rid of it. The safest thing is to use plants that are native to your area. If you aren't sure where to get them, search on the internet the words native plants with your locality, and you will find vendors of native species that will control erosion, filter pollutants, and provide wildlife habitat. The choke cherry is a super good example of that. It has a really beautiful flower. Uh, it produces a purple berry, which which the birds just love. Look for species that you know are adapted to your property's specific soil and climate conditions. And see things in other parts of your property that move well and take it and take it from one part and put it in another part. 
when we first moved here, I started out using plants that I bought. First thing I planted was some Pachysandra, and then I did some Periwinkle. And then we decided that we really should start thinking about something more natural. So we're replacing those with some beer berries, and um, we found grasses in the woods that we uh, put in along our sidewalk. Invasive species thrive on disturbed soil, so during construction, preserving the native seed bank is important. Cover over the very top of the topography that you want to rebuild with the soil that you had excavated from the top. And all the life that's native to the surface would be put back in place. It won't look like it at first. We have wild flowers that are just unbelievable, just by being very, very patient. The native plants that grow there naturally will not require chemicals to thrive. Choosing plants and turf grass that require chemicals to look good. Uh, that's just uh, inviting problems, and, and it's not necessary. Why waste your money? But encouraging versus removing native vegetation takes a shift in cultural values. I see a change happening. I got off, you know, the, the regular path, like Robert Frost said. You know, I came to the opening, and there were two paths. I took the one less traveled, and it made all the difference. That video talks about plants that are aggressive spreaders, but you are talking about uh, even plants that aren't aggressive spreaders shouldn't be planted if they're not native. Now that's very controversial. In fact, there was an article this summer um, written by Mark Davis and I guess 18 other scientists that was printed in Nature magazine. It was entitled, um, Don't Judge Species on Their Origins. And they have uh, objected to some of these concepts. They're saying that it's actually a falsehood to say that uh, invasive plants are causing extinctions of native plants. How would you address that? Uh, for that particular point, I would, I would make a distinction between global extinction and local extinction. So it is true that so far there are no records of global extinction where a plant disappears from the planet, uh, at least on continents, when an introduced species invades. There are records on islands where the species disappears. Hmm. Uh, but there are many records where locally, if a plant, for example, kudzu, takes over uh, and, and smothers the local plant life, where the species that used to be there disappear. So we call that local extinction. Even if a plant doesn't, doesn't disappear, though, you may find one or two individuals. Um, there's something called functional extinction, where it becomes so, so uh, uncommon, so reduced in numbers, that it's no longer performing its role in its ecosystem. Uh, and that needs to be addressed as well. We need function in our ecosystems. The extinction on a local level reminds me of the yard I had uh, several years ago where I planted euonymus and myrtle as a ground cover, and pretty soon I couldn't plant anything else. No other flowers, or no flowers at all. And the local um, level extinction in terms of uh, Hurricane Andrew, we were talking about that before the show, that it caused a, a wipeout of certain species because they weren't, just weren't enough of them. Right, particular birds. I think it was uh, one of the subspecies of seaside sparrow that actually uh, went globally extinct. It disappeared after that because it was reduced to a single small population and then that storm happened to hit where that population was. Uh, so the birds couldn't recover. And that's the problem with reducing uh, our local species so much in numbers that they're just a few remaining. Then they're, then they're highly vulnerable to extinction. Hmm. And there's critics of Davis's um, points are saying that extinctions aren't the only problem, um, that there's many other problems besides that. Right. Uh, the notion that we can move plants all over the, the planet without uh, any, any uh, resulting problems um, is, is a problem in itself because plants do a number of different things. What I focused on is their role in terms of supporting other types of life, so their role in providing food for food webs. And unfortunately, plants from, from Asia, for example, are very poor at doing that in North America. And likewise, plants from North America are poor at doing that in, in Asia. Um, so that's an argument that hasn't been addressed by, by Davis and, and uh, some of the other uh, critics of, of uh, fighting invasive species. Um, they, they're assuming that these plants can be interchanged and you'll have, they'll be the ecological equivalents of the plants they're displacing. Um, and, and I wish they were because they're displacing plants all over the world. But unfortunately, all the data suggests that they're not the ecological equivalents. And when a, an introduced plant invades, diversity of, of uh, food webs all the other life forms that are there drops dramatically. 
I came across a study that some <coughs> researchers at Penn State had done, and they had um, examined the amount of birds in an area where they had invasive honeysuckle, exotic alien, those are kind of interchangeable terms, but um, I, uh, they found that there, was, there were more fruit-eating birds in that area. What did you think of that? Um, and, and it's true. They measured uh, cardinals and, and robins, I believe, and found that there were more, more birds eating the berries when the berries were, were being produced in the fall. Um, and I hear this argument a lot. We need, to, we need to compare what is gained by these species with what is lost. What that study didn't address uh, is what happens during reproduction when the birds are reproducing. So in the fall, um, there are some birds that are eating, eating seeds and berries. And when you present a lot of them, they'll, they'll be there. But when the birds are reproducing in the spring, they're eating insects. They're feeding their young insects. And unfortunately, honeysuckle, uh, bush honeysuckle and Japanese honeysuckle, are very poor at producing the insects that these birds need to become birds. So if we allow the landscape to be covered with the, an invasive species that may produce a berry, which is why it's invasive to begin with, um, we're, go we're gonna have very few birds in those areas because there aren't the food, the, the insect populations to support them. That's, that's the problem with, with letting these plants spread. So, a, so looking at what uh, an invasive plant does at only a certain part of the, the reproductive life cycle of, of a, uh, a particular bird is a problem. You have to look at it during the entire year and then make an assessment about what's gained and what's lost. That study also didn't address all of the migrating warblers that are eating insects alone. When they get to that area in the spring, what are they going to eat? The berries that are produced in the fall won't help them. Hmm. Ecosystems are very complex, hard, yeah. to, hard to predict what kind of problems we'll have. Um, Bernd Blasey at Cornell, I saw him speak at a conference last year, and he <coughs> is saying that some areas are so badly infested with, for instance, Phragmites or whatever, um, that we shouldn't be throwing pesticides and money at them. We should just let them go, take the species out of the area that we care about, and put them in sanctuaries. And your focus is on yards. Do you think that our yards can become sanctuaries for these rare species? Uh, I do, because we have so, so many yards. I mean, we're not talking about small, isolated areas. We're talking about huge areas of the country. Tens of thousands of square miles are now in our suburban neighborhoods. And our corporate landscapes can do the same thing. Um, so I always talk about, about creating a new national park, and we can call it a homegrown national park. Hmm. But uh, if we took half the area that is now in lawn out of lawn, we could have 20 million acres of uh, what I call biological corridors in, in suburban areas. Wow, that's a lot of space. 20 million space. acres, is, a, is it's, it's far bigger than any of our national parks. Um, so we're not talking about isolated little, little uh, sanctuaries. We're talking about converting... Um, areas that have been taken out of, of ecosystem production and, and making them productive again. Hmm. Along roadsides, I love it when I see the wildflowers, and there's so many roadsides. I mean, I... Four million miles of roadsides. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Goes yes. on for a long time. In the U.S. alone, right? Wow. Um, <clears throat> we uh, are talking mostly about a conversation or a debate that's going on nationally, but uh, locally, this conversation has been going on for quite some time. At least I've been aware of it for about 10 years. Uh, for instance, uh, the Michigan Invasive Plant Council, that's not a government um, council, but a group that was put together a while back. And they uh, are very cautious about uh, listing any plant that has been valuable to the nursery industry as invasive. And then there's another group called the Michigan Invasive Plant Network. And they, on the other hand, have uh, listed quite a few, in fact, um, about eight or so that are very common to um, horticulture. You see them in stores all the time. Um, and I'm not going to read them all off. Maybe we could show them on the screen. But um, the interesting thing about them is they've got alternatives, native plants that you can buy instead. So what I've been wondering is, why can't the horticultural industry make money off of the native plants instead of the invasive ones? Uh, well, I would argue that they could if they decided that was, was a goal. Right now, they're concerned that the public won't buy native plants because they haven't for the last hundred years. Um, we, have, we have come as a society to view plants as decorations only. We have forgotten what their, their ecological roles are. Uh, but um, you know, it's one of the things I'm trying to do is convince people that, that yes, plants are beautiful, but they do really important things, and we have to 
we have to have them doing those things even where, where we live. So if that message catches on, uh, we have 129 million homes in the U.S., and if everybody uh, starts to add native plants to their landscape, that's a, a huge boon for the nursery industry. It's not going to, to cut sales. It's going to increase sales dramatically if they start to carry these plants. And of course, nurserymen are businessmen. They want to sell plants. Um, and as long as the plant's going to sell, they will, they will carry it. So I see it as a, as a, as a, a, you know, a boon for, for the future of the nursery industry. And it's, it's a new thing, like it's new in my life. I've got a new hobby. I'm really interested right. in native right. plants and I've been buying way more plants than I had in the past because it's, it's exciting. And it reminds me of how it used to be that they wanted things from other countries because they were new. So maybe if we all realize that this is our new new. <laughs> the new new can be, can be the old. But let's not forget what these plants are doing. When we put these plants from, from our, our local habitats into our yards, we then get to see all the things those plants attract, mm -hmm. the hummingbirds mm, and, the, yeah, and the butterflies. Those are so and, beautiful. Yeah, it, so we get to interact with nature um, the way we can't when we're using plants from, from Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it goes beyond the plant then. It reconnects us with, with the connection uh, to nature that we lost um, so many years ago. I've heard that sometimes the nursery industries are uh, worried about their stock. They have built up years of these invasive plants and they can't just throw them all away. They'll lose a lot of money. Have you heard of answers for that? Uh, well, you can, you can if, if you're going to regulate the sale of these, these plants, you can put in a grandfather clause. Um, so you say, well, in three years, um, the sale of burning bush is going to be uh, either outlawed or highly discouraged. So in that three years, get rid of the stock that you have. So nobody, nobody's trying to punish the industry uh, or, or cripple any individual nurserymen. Um, we understand that, that stock is, you know, inventory is, is money. Mm -hmm. um, but given enough lead time, uh, then you, you simply don't make an order of, of more burning bush and you bring in viburnum dentatum instead and, and mm -hmm. uh, you have a, a, a viable switch. In Michigan, I don't know what it's like in Delaware. Well, maybe we should address that. What What is it like in terms of regulations against invasive um, Delaware plants? doesn't have any regulations against them. They have, uh, they've made suggestions. So they encourage nurserymen to, uh, if they're selling a, an invasive plant, to label it as such. Um, they also encourage them not to sell it, but there's no, no formal regulations against it. Mm -hmm. And in Michigan, there's not many that are regulated. Um, especially that are valuable to nursery. In fact, the only one I know of is purple loosestrife. And even that I have found um, for sale on websites uh, recently. So I think there's some kind of loophole situation going on with that. But do you think that states that aren't going to regulate, do you think that the nurseries have some kind of responsibility to voluntarily take these things off the market? Uh, I do, but it's a tough issue. Because again, these people are in business, and um, it's like asking somebody uh, if they have a public that's anxious to buy this plant to punish themselves by not selling it. What I'm trying to do is educate the public so that they can they can change what they're asking for. The nursery industry has simply responded to what we, as the public, has have demanded over the last century. You know, we want plants that bloom 700 days of the year, and and. Uh, all kinds of crazy exotic things because, again, we've used plants only as decorations. Um, but again, if, 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 we, if we choose a plant that's going to bring the Cecropia moth into our, our lives, uh, we can't use a plant from, from Asia to do that. Uh, so I'm trying to get the public to, to uh, work with the nursery industry and the nursery industry does not want to carry inventory they can't sell. If they're going to carry native plants, we have to buy them. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of at that that uh, interface that's uncomfortable. Ed education is um, so important. And when you go to a store, I mean, if you haven't read up ahead of time, you need to know what's available. For instance, I have a plant, I got the tag. I can't remember where I bought this, but it says American Natives and it's foam flower. And I looked it up and it is indeed native. Is. And I, when I saw that, I was like, <coughs> oh good, I want to buy that. And um, Meyer Thrifty Acres here in Michigan, I guess it's Midwest, um, they have labeled, not their natives, I wish they would do that, but they've at least uh, labeled a lot of plants as not invasive, mm -hmm. a whole lot of them. So that's a good thing. And they've also taken four pro products off the market, four species that, and two of them are very um, popular at um, landscape uh, venues, privet and um, uh, 
uh, Norway maple, mm -hmm. which has been contr very controversial. So that's amazing that they're doing that, I think. And I also wonder about the labeling. For instance, when I was going to landscape that property where I bought all the euonymus and myrtle, I would have loved it if somebody had put on the labels, you know, think twice about planting this. Right. Um, but instead, it said something like hardy, aggress uh, excuse me, um, vigorous grower. Right. It, it seems like there's, <laughs> you know, some responsibility in how you term things. Right, but remember we're, we're changing the landscaping paradigm um, very quickly here and many of those labels were printed years ago, maybe mm -hmm. decades ago, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we simply haven't recognized all the areas that we can improve. Mm -hmm. Many nurseries are doing that and, and m many members of the public are, are far better educated than they used to be and are going mm -hmm. and, and demanding it. Mm -hmm. But in the old days if you walked into a nursery and said I want a native plant, they thought if it grew in the woods it was native. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there were many things from Asia that grew really well in, in the woods, so, so we're getting better. <laughs> well, um, another thing I would like to address is this um, handout from Michigan Invasive Plant Council. They do various assessments on plants, and one of them is English ivy, and I thought this had some interesting thoughts in it. They talk about English ivy as not being um, invasive uh, in a significant manner in Michigan. And they say that uh, if a gardener um, doesn't want it, they can simply remove the plants. And it says, pull them up or use chemicals. Um, and you have talked in your book quite a bit about the uh, garden you have and how much work you've put into it. Do you think that they're kind of oversimplifying that? Uh, in several ways. Um, you know, English ivy is, is uh, one of the plants that was brought in and exhibited a lag time. So it was sold for years and was not uh, an invasive species, didn't move around. Um, and then all of a sudden it did, and that's what many of these, these species are doing. It's already banned in, in Oregon, where it's a, a very serious invasive. It's a serious invasive in many places in the east. So to assume that, that it's not going to become invasive in Michigan is, is really a, a stretch. Um, the scientific evidence that it will be, or already is, is, is pretty good. Um, and, and if you, if you minimize the impact uh, and the amount of work it takes to, to get rid of these, these plants, all I'll say is for any homer who has English ivy, try getting rid of it and see how easy <laughs> that is. Um, pulling it doesn't do anything. It leaves too many roots and will come up all over the place because it roots everywhere it, it goes. Uh, and yes, you can, you can drench your yard in, in Roundup or some other herbicide and eventually you will kill it. But, um, it's one of the tougher things to, to manage. So it is far easier to prevent these invasions than to encourage them. And when you blanket an area with a, a pesticide, then you've got like just a, a open space. That, and what's the first Th then thing you that have comes an, back? You, you have an open niche. And of course, invasive species are really good at beating the natives back. That's why they're invasive. Um, so if you're going to remove a, a plant that, that uh, shouldn't be there, you should have a plan of, of what native plant to put back in that space because empty spaces, empty niches just invite reinvasion. And then you're, you're at this for the rest of your life. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of work as it is, but, but uh, you're really, you're conducting a restoration. So removal is ha the first half, but replanting is the second half. You want to have a plan about how to do that. Which isn't cheap, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> I've done so much of this that sometimes I wonder whether it isn't that um, the two camps haven't really um, walked in each other's shoes. Mm -hmm. if, if people knew what it was like to try to get rid of this stuff and to try to restore with new plants, and the same goes for, you know, if we worked in the nursery industry and we knew what it was like to try to make a living, you know. So sometimes I think that's part of the problem. That, that's for sure, but, but let me emphasize how, how worth it it is. We've done this at, at our house, and um, it was nothing but invasive species. Uh, and they still seed in, so we still have to watch it every year, but the plants that are there are 99% you know, uh, native at this point, and it's, it's, uh, it's a living paradise. It really is. Every oh, day we great. see something, something new. So it's not simply a matter of getting rid of the plants. It's a matter of inviting all these other life forms into your life. So enriching. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, one other thing that I want to mention about this, it talks about it's um, due to Michigan's short growing season that they feel that um, ivy is not going to be a, English ivy is not going to be a problem here. But um, that reminds me of when they used to think that the various 
uh, oriental honeysuckles weren't going to be a problem in Michigan because we have such cold winters, but it turns out they did okay. And then with climate change, it makes me wonder. Right. All those things are a factor. If, if there are any places in Michigan where English ivy is making berries, it will move because the birds eat those berries and then fly off and poop them out someplace else. Hmm. Which reminds me of oriental bittersweet. You were telling me before the show that there's no such thing as um, the native bittersweet pretty much in Michigan because they've interbred or? Um, oh, yes, uh, hybridization. Hybridization. So there's oriental bittersweet and, and, and uh, American bittersweet. And uh, in, in Delaware, you can't find anywhere in the east uh, except in the northern parts of New, New England. Um, American bittersweet is gone because it is hybridized with uh, oriental bittersweet. And it's, it's uh, through introgression. It's very much what's happened with the uh, Africanized bee. Mm. Um, after the second generation, you have pure Africanized bee. And, and same thing with the uh, Oriental bittersweet. When it hybridizes with American bittersweet and then reproduces again, you've got just uh, Oriental bittersweet. So that will lead to the extinction of that plant. And then we'll have our first record of, a, mm. of an extinction of Which a native really plant. concerns me because I see that being sold in the farmer's market locally. Yes, yes. And if you want to try having fun getting rid of something, try getting rid of Oriole and Bittersweet. Yeah, yeah. That. Well, you talk about a paradigm shift in here, and I want to let you know that it happened to me because <laughs> I planted some native bushes, and I immediately got holes in them. And I was so excited. <laughs> I went, oh, they found me. They found me. And it used to be I would have gone out and bought pesticides to kill the insects. So I thought, there's that paradigm shift. It's happened to me. Let me point out some research we've done, though, to, to uh, address the thing that people worry about most. If you do have all these insects eating your native plants, then they'll be ugly because so much of the leaf will be eaten. But in fact, we've, we've measured insect damage on properties that are largely native versus properties that are traditionally landscaped. And there's actually less damage on the native uh, hmm. properties because the natural enemies that control these, these insects come to your property um, when you have them, and you have a, a food web that's in balance, so you don't have too many herbivores uh, as you would when, when uh, you don't have those natural enemies around. Well, it looks like we're out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> this has been a great show. Uh, we've provided links to resources relevant to today's show on our webpage at ewashington.org forward slash greenroom. This includes a link to watch the Home on the Shore video in its entirety. Thanks for joining us here in the greenroom.